you think about Jesus and his life and the impact of his life, it is really an amazing thing. He was an itinerant street preacher. He wasn't born to uh, earthly royalty. Uh, he didn't have a, a position of political prominence or power or anything of the sort. He was, he was a street preacher. And he, he didn't travel all over the world. He stayed within a very uh, small region there, over there around, around Jerusalem. And yet, his life has had such a massive impact on the world. We mark time by when Jesus was born, or at least we used to. A.D. and B.C., Anno Domino, the year of our, our, our Lord. We live in the, the year of our Lord, 2000. 17, uh, billions of people's lives have been changed because of, of Jesus. And there's a reason for that. Uh, he wasn't just a man. Jesus was God on earth. If you look at John chapter 1, John chapter 1, you want to know why this itinerant street preacher could have such an impact on the world? John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Down in verse 14 we see, and the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Speaking of Jesus, he was God in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, as we read about uh, the account of the, the announcements of the birth of Jesus, behold, it was fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Those 33 years or so that Jesus was here, God was with us. In the flesh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul apparently dealing with the, the heresy of, of Gnosticism that says that Jesus didn't really dwell in the flesh because all flesh is inherently evil. Uh, Paul, in dealing with that, said, For in him Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Jesus, uh, was when he was here, he was God in the flesh. And he is the prophesied Messiah. You go back into the Old Testament, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve uh, were still in the garden, and uh, Satan tempted Eve, and she ate of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she gave it to Adam, and he, he ate it as well, and God uh, cursed them for their sin. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we see the first prophecy of Jesus, where God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, as he cursed the, the serpent, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Of course, the serpent was Satan. He took on the form of a serpent to tempt Eve, and God put a curse on him. He put enmity between his seed and the seed of the woman, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Of course, the bruising of the heel was the, the crucifixion of Jesus, and, and the bruising of his head was Jesus being raised from the dead. And we see a prophecy there about the Messiah. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, God reaffirmed to Abraham that in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. You go back to Genesis chapter 3 and God had told Abram, who became Abraham, to get out of his country and to go to a place that he was showing. His, his descendants would be uh, as the sand uh, on the seashore or the stars in the sky. Uh, he would bless those who bless him and curse those who cursed him. Uh, he would give him the land of Canaan, and in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And that's speaking, of course, of Jesus. He is the prophesied Messiah. Moses, when he gave the law the second time in Deuteronomy, in chapter 18 and verses 18 and 19, he said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and this is God speaking through Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him, and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. That prophet who God would raise up like Moses is Jesus, if you turn to Acts chapter 3. Turn with me to Acts the third chapter. <coughs> yeah. 
beginning in verse 11. Peter and John have just healed the man at the beautiful gate of the temple. Now there was a lame man who was healed, verse 11, held on to Peter and John. All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquity. Jesus is that prophet. Psalm 2. Psalm 2 <coughs> prophesies the coming kingdom that God would set his anointed on uh, the throne. Psalm 2. Turn with me to Psalm 2. Verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves... And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. That also is a reference to Jesus, that anointed one, the king who would be set on his holy hill of Zion. Uh, I turn with me to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 22 and 23. And when he had removed him, speaking of Saul, God had removed Saul from being king over Israel. When he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. Jesus is that uh, king from the lineage of David. Let's get down to verse 28. And though they found no cause for death in him, speaking of Jesus, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He, he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the Father. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Again, Jesus is this promised king, the one who would be set on the holy hill of Zion, the anointed one. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. The first gospel sermon. Peter says of Jesus, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. 
whom God raised up, having loosed the pounds of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. And he's quoting there from the 16th Psalm, verses 8 through 11. Men and brethren, verse 29. Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he's God in the flesh. He is the promised Messiah. He came to this earth and he humbled himself. If you turn to Philippians chapter 2. Jesus came to this earth. He humbled himself. Verse 5. Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Jesus humbled himself to the, and took on the form of a human and he was obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. If you turn to John chapter 13, John chapter 13, verse 2, we see the extent to which Jesus humbled himself. John chapter 13, and verse 2, and supper being ended, this is, this is the last supper. Jesus gathered with his apostles. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. You know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus humbled himself to the point that he was willing to wash the disciples' feet, and he said he did it for an example. And we're supposed to learn from that. That was the humility which he displayed. God in the flesh, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, washing the feet of his disciples to set an example. He humbled himself. He perfectly kept the will of God. John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He said in John chapter 6 and verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. You compare that to John chapter 17 and verse 4, when Jesus prayed <clears throat> after the Last Supper. He prayed in verse 4, he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. That's what Jesus was sent to do, and that's exactly what he did. He kept the will of God perfectly. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 tells us we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. 
Jesus as God in the flesh was subject to the same types of temptations that we are. And yet he lived a sinlessly perfect life. And he offered himself a perfect sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews the ninth chapter in verse 26 beginning. <clears throat> Comparing Jesus' priesthood to the earthly priest, it says uh, in verse 26, He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages, He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for Him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Back in verse 22, we're told, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And the blood of bulls and goats, verse 4, chapter 10, says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It took the blood of Jesus, beginning in verse 10 there in Hebrews chapter 10, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. And that's talking about what goes on under the law of Moses. The sacrificing of these bulls and goats whose blood could never take away sins. They have to offer these things repeatedly. It says back up there in verse uh, 3, there's a, in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. But this man, verse 12, <coughs> after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. Jesus' perfectly sinless life, uh, because he lived that perfectly sinless life, he could be that perfectly sinless sacrifice who shed blood that could take away sins, that could, not only could, but does. If you turn back to Acts chapter 10, <clears throat> in verses 38 39, is, uh, Peter there preaches to Cornelius and, and his household, we see there that he says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And we are his witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they killed by hanging on a tree. He was crucified. That's how he was sacrificed. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 again back to the uh, announcement of the birth of Jesus. She will bring forth, she Mary will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. He shed his blood that our sins might be taken away and his blood uh, is sufficient to do that. And he is the only way to salvation. You know, sin separates us from God, Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Our sins separate us from God and Jesus is the only way for us to be reconciled to God through his blood. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we see the importance of this itinerant street preacher. God in the flesh, the Messiah, who humbled himself, kept the will of God perfectly, and offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. He is the only way to have our fellowship restored with God. He is the only way to the Father. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us there is, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's only through Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing is in Christ, and that includes forgiveness and salvation. But Jesus didn't just make a bunch of claims. These are not empty claims. He is who he claimed to be. John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Notice what John says there. He says in verse 30, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You read through the Gospels and you see the miracles that Jesus worked. We have eyewitness accounts of the miracles that Jesus worked. <coughs> Healing the sick. Casting out demons. Raising the dead. Walking on water. 
calming the seas. And the things that are written are written so that we might believe, but they're not the only things that he did. These are written that we might believe. And most importantly, if you look at Romans chapter 1, <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. It is not an empty claim. His tomb was empty. He ascended back to the Father. He was raised from the dead. And He will judge us by His Word. He will judge everybody by His Word. We read John chapter 5 this morning. Let's read it again. It's not going to hurt us. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word, and this is Jesus speaking, and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Of course, he's speaking of the spiritually dead. If we hear his voice and we obey him, we're going to live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Verse 28 says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. All who are in the graves are going to be raised and be judged. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And John chapter 12 and verse 48 tells us that Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Our actions, whether good or bad, how do we determine whether they're good or bad? It's by the word that Jesus has spoken. If we reject that, then we have that that's going to judge us. And so the question then is, are you ready for that day when he will come back and judge the world? We're told in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, having been perfected, he, Jesus, became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. If you've not obeyed the gospel, you are not ready. You're not ready to see the Lord in judgment. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? There are so many people who call Jesus Lord, Lord, and then live their life and it declares something else. He's not really their Lord because they don't do what he says. And that's the point Jesus is making here. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. <clears throat> Matthew the 7th chapter beginning in verse 21. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Be a wise man and actually do these sayings of Jesus. That's the point that he makes there. And if you're not doing the things that Jesus has said, then you are not ready for that day. And so I encourage you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ today while you have the opportunity. You have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. John chapter 8 and, and verse 24, Jesus said, Unless that we believe that he is he, <laughs> that we'll die in our sins. John chapter 8 and verse 24.
Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, the Son of God, you will die in your sins. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus said, No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. If we don't change our mind and change our lives, we're going to perish. He says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, that if we confess him before men, he will confess us before his Father who is in heaven. If we deny him before men, he will deny us before his Father who is in heaven. We have to make that good confession. And we have to be baptized. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. If you've never done that, you need to do it tonight. While you have the opportunity. And then he says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Be thou faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. We have to be faithful. We have to walk in the light as he is in the light. 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 through 9 tell us. We have to walk in the light. Which means walk in the truth of his word. Keeping his sayings. And if we'll do that, when that judgment day comes, we'll be told, well done, good and faithful servant. But if not, we'll hear, depart from me, I never knew you. If you're not ready to face the Lord, won't you get ready? Whatever your need might be, won't you come forward and make it known? While together we stand and sing.